finished up Revelation chapter 1 last week, so as you're heading to your seats. Uh, we'll be starting with chapter 2. We're going to start with the, the letters to the churches. And I need to remember to get some things to put up on the overhead on the screen for you for next week. Let's see if this works. Not great to follow my notes anyway, so... So these are seven letters to the seven churches. Let's back up to chapter 1, verse 17, just to kind of get a running start at chapter 2. It says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet de as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which, are, which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the, uh, the seven lampstands are the seven lampstands which you saw. Excuse me, are the seven churches. All right, so as we're getting into this, he explains what he's about to see, how he's going to address the churches, right? The, the lampstands, we talked about being a light to the world. The lampstands were not candle stands, which sometimes we tend to refer to the menorahs as. Candle stands are self-consuming, right? They burn down, they burn the candle out. But a lampstand was filled with oil, which represents us being filled with the Holy Spirit. It represents the Holy Spirit of God. In the lampstand. Um, so the seven churches are the lampstands. We're the lights to the world. We talked about the angel. There are seven angels to the seven churches. That word angel can also be translated messenger. It, it is concerning John the Baptist. That he was his the messenger that would go before the Lord. It's the same word angelos. So most of the time it's translated as angels. But in certain areas, and especially in these, I think it's, it's translated as messenger. So it's probably referring to the pastors or the elders of those particular churches that we're going to look at now. Um, John, again, writing this in the island of Patmos, had been the pastor or the elder of Ephesus leading up to this, was taken by Domitian and put on, on the island of Patmos. Uh, exiled there. He had been there for about 30 years prior to this. So the very first letter out of the box here is to the church that he was overseeing. So think about that. And however, uh, whatever the time span was of him being taken out and, and put into exile and, and then writing this, this book, he... Here's a rebuke of the church that he was working so hard at. If you have titles in your, in your Bible that um, kind of split up the churches and make it a little easier to find them, you probably have the loveless church as the title for this church, the church of Ephesus, at Ephesus, because the charge is going to be they've left their first love. So you think about that, the the disciple whom Jesus loved, he called himself, we often refer to him as uh, the love disciple or the apostle of love. Trying to get all of that into this church, trying to keep that the focus of this church for however long he was there, the 30 years that he was there, to hear they've left that in just probably a short time since he's been taken. So it says in verse 1, to the angel... Uh, of the church at, at Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars 
in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those uh, who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored in, for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give uh, to eat of the tree of life, uh, which is in the midst of the, par of the paradise of God. All right, so as we go through these books, we're going to see that there's kind of a pattern for all of them. You have the, the introduction of who he is, right? Uh, and it has to do with what we read about him in chapter 1, right? So here it's, uh, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his, in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, which we just saw previous in chapter 1. Each one of these letters is going to have an aspect of Jesus from chapter 1, as kind of their introduction. This is who it's coming from. Now, John is the hand that he's using to write these letters, but uh, he's putting kind of his salutation or even his signature, his mark, on each of the letters that are going to these churches. Now, these churches, as you, I think as you read through here, we can uh, assume that all of the churches read all of the letters. It's not like John put uh, to the church of Ephesus and then sent the rest of, of the book, but not the letter to the church of Smyrna. All these churches were kind of in the same general vicinity in Asia Minor, in, in what we would call Turkey now. So they're all kind of in that area. Pretty close to one another. Ephesus is the only church mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. The rest of these churches aren't mentioned in anywhere else in the Bible except right here in Revelation. Uh, Ephesus is mentioned in in Acts from like chapter uh, seventeen, I believe, to chapter twenty. Paul's living there. He establishes that church. I think Ephesus is the place where, excuse me, he spent the most time, the most, yeah, he was two or three years that he was in Ephesus. Now compare that to uh, Thessalonica, uh, where the Thessalonian church was. He's only there for a couple of weeks before he's run out. So Paul spent a lot of time there, and we see that in, in Acts. So if you want to know kind of the history of Ephesus, you can, you can see a little bit of that. And Paul's warning there is that as he's leaving for the last time and he's, he's in Miletus, I think it is, on the beach and he's saying goodbye to the elders and to the church and he's, he's warning the elders, there are, there are wolves that are going to come in like sheep to, to devour, to divide, to cause trouble. And there are even going to be some who rise up from among you who are going to do the same, who are going to be self-seeking and self-promoting and wanting your attention rather than diverting it to God. He warns them about that in Acts chapter 20. So this is a church that's worked hard and, and probably taken that warning and tried to apply it. We see that Jesus commends them first, right? He, he introduces himself, then he commends them. I know your works. And, and the the word there in the Greek I know is to, I continually know. It's not like I've known or I've heard. I know, I know what's going on right now in, in your works. Your labor, your patience, you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. 
So they know how to test people according to the Scripture. They've been taught well. They've had Paul. They've had Timothy. They've had John. You know, after, after Paul kind of leaves the area, eventually Timothy ends up there. Timothy is there for... Uh, in fact, the, the letters to Timothy are kind of instructing him how to be the pastor in that area. And we know Timothy will give his life. He's going to be beaten to death in Ephesus. And then John will show up there and be there for 30 years. So they've been taught well how to work, what to do. If there's a church, if you're just looking on the face of a church, if there's a church you want to be a part of, this is it. I mean, look at all the programs they have, right? This is the one you walk in, there's a whole board full of, this is where your kid goes, this is where your youngest kid goes, this is what days of the week you can be here for extra things, this is the Bible study prayer meeting, this is all this stuff is all going on. These are the outreach days. These, it's all here. We have everything. And Jesus even commends them for that, right? I know your works, your labor, your patience. And listen, the Christian life has some labor to it, doesn't it? It, it, it works. If you're doing the works that God has called us to do, and we are, even in Ephesians, in the book of, of Ephesians, Paul will tell them, you are his workmanship created to do Good works in Christ, which were appointed beforehand. All right, so right after salvation, Paul's saying, you're not, you don't just get saved and then just sit around and, and not do anything. There are works, there are things created for you to do. God has things he wants you to be active in. And that's good. And, and when he says you are his workmanship, that's poema. You're his artistry. You're his, you're his poem. You are his words being worked out and lived out among the people. He's active in your life. But Paul's there even still. That's a, that's a you and God together. That, that's a, you, you are bonded to him. You love him. You're doing these things because you love him. Not to gain his affection, but because he's given you his affection Already. Right? You're not trying to get God's attention by doing the works you have. You know you have his attention. You know he loves you. And so you part of walking with him and having that relationship with him is doing things together with him. And, it, and it's played out in uh, what Paul uses in Ephesians, the, the marriage, Right? And, it, and it's not just, well, I'm not going to go there because I'm messing it up already in my head, so I'm not even going to try to explain where it's going with that. But anyways, that relationship, that tight bond relationship, that I'm in love with her, she's in love with me relationship, right? And, it, and it's all decision. You decide to love somebody. And that's important in this letter. Love's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not a warm fuzzy there's all kinds of emotions that come when you love somebody. Right? Somebody, you can, you can mourn for somebody that you love. You will mourn because you love them. Whether it's because they've gone home, right? They, they've, they've passed away, or because they've just broken away. You, you, you mourn that. So think about this in this letter that Jesus is writing. You know, and, and listen, you can have, <clears throat> if you've been married for a long time, you probably already understand this. There are going to be times in your marriage sometimes when you're like, I'm just going through the motions. Right? I'm not getting up and deciding every day to love my wife. I'm just getting up every day and going through my routine every day that I do. And somehow she's supposed to know out of me doing my routine that, that she loves me, or that I love her. And so she should, she should be putting that back on me because I hold to these things. I get this, 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 and this done for her every day. So why don't I, why don't I have the feelings? Why don't, I, why don't I feel like she loves me? Maybe it's just because it's just routine. Right? You're not doing it because you love her. You're doing it because you've got to get through your day. 
You're doing it because you're going to get through your morning. You do it originally because you loved her, because you love her, for her, or for him. <coughs> I'm picking on a man because I'm going from a man's perspective. We do it because we love him. I mean, we get up. Maybe, you, maybe your thing every morning is to make breakfast. Maybe your thing every morning is, yeah, maybe it's just going to work. Whatever it is. Picking up your dirty clothes. Maybe it's, just, maybe it's that. <laughs> or maybe, maybe you don't think you need to do that because you do so many other things. And your wife's going, you know, man, if you love me, you'd pick those things up and put them in the laundry instead of me. And, and we start worrying more about ourselves, don't we? I'm fulfilling my role. How come I'm not getting anything in return? Well, here's the deal. Jesus has already shown us in his word where we're heading with him. Right? We have, and we've talked about this, uh, the blessed hope of his soon return. One of the last things he said to his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Right? I'm going to my father's house. <coughs> That's all engagement language. For the day. That's all in the proposal of the, in the betrothal. When they would come together and the, the, the young man would, you know, they get to all that point. They go through all the other things that, that bring him to this moment. And he pours that cup of wine and he hands it to her. And if she accepts his proposal, she drinks all of it. And then he says to her, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for us, for you. That, so that where I am, you can be. I'll, and I'm coming to get you. I will come and get you. And it would take about a year. And, and you know, when it was coming time and getting close, everybody knows it's getting close, so certain things are starting to take, ha are starting to take place. But <clears throat> that, you know, it, imagine if your, if your husband had said, hey, I'm going to go... Take, I'm, I'm going to go prepare a place for us now. After he got down on the knee, gave you the big ring, and made all the, all the hoopla, and made you cry, and whatever else, and took you to a nice dinner, and all that, and he said, all right, now I'm going to go prepare a place for you. You don't see him for another year. How many times in that year, in our culture, would you say, if he loved me, he'd call me. If he loved me, he'd show up. If he loved me, he'd take me somewhere today. And then as that, as that got pushed back farther then because he's spending all of his time with you, well, if he loved me, he'd hurry up and finish this house. You know what I'm saying? We, we want, we want to be loved, but giving love, deciding ourselves to pour it out there without expecting anything in return is hard. It's not easy. And Ephesus they were doing the things, all the things that look good, all the things that would make a church grow. In our culture, you might say they had the big building, they had the gymnasium attached to the building, they had all the kids' programs, they had all of this, everything for some, so I can just go and sit in the pew. I can, I can drop my kid off to glorify daycare for a couple hours, and I can go sit in the pew and be fed. That, that's what we want, right? That, that is, unfortunately, the modern church. Now, the people who are doing the serving, I'm not putting this on them. Right? Some people doing the works, oh, I'm in Sunday school and I don't get to go, in, and they start to complain a little bit because they're feeling like they're starving a little bit. And, and, but they'll tell you, I'm back here because I love the kids. Maybe they are. Or maybe that was the original intent. But somewhere along the line, they've lost their communication with God. Right? They've quit picking up their Bible. The, the church buys a curriculum. Here's your curriculum. Here's your color pages or whatever it might be. Here you go. It's all laid out for you. Just go put it in front of the kids. Awesome. Man, it just made my job easy. That's great. 
You say, well, you know, people get burned out back there. That, that can be true. But this word labor here is work to the point of exhaustion. It's not the only time it's used in the Bible of the Christian life that we're to work to the point of exhaustion. But then how do I have love if I'm working to the point of exhaustion? Well, it makes you keep going even that. Because in, in verse 3, he says, You have persevered and have patience and have labored, that's that same word, for my name's sake and have not become weary. So work to the point of exhaustion, but I'm not stopping. See, doesn't this sound great? Aren't these the people you want to go to church with? So here's the challenge to all of us, assuming that we all today want to be here together. I hear you guys. I hear the, the fellowship that's taking place, the laughing, the joking, the, the talking about things that have happened this week and all of that. And we, and we don't have, we're not a big church, so we don't have a lot, but we have some extra things that go on during the week. But remember, Jesus is going to say that on that day, some people are going to stand in front of him and say, you know, Lord, Lord, haven't I cast out demons? Haven't I done this in your name? Haven't I done that in your name? Haven't I? And, he, and you're going to peel off a list of all the things you've done in the name of the Lord. And he's going to say, I don't know you. And this is why I think John put such a great emphasis, not on just the deity of Jesus in the Gospel of John, but also on the Word of God in the Gospel of John. You can know the name. You can claim the name. But if you don't know him, I mean, everybody in here knows me at a different level. I don't expect you to know Jesus at the same level I do, and some of you may know him at a greater level than I do. But you get to know him, the one whose name you claim, by knowing what he says, by knowing what he wants, by knowing his teaching. And you only know that if you know the word, and if you're in it. Sometimes, and I don't always think this, it's not like I've never given a devotional to anybody before. People ask me, here's a good devotional. I, I try to find one, or at least a devotional that I know I can trust the, the person who wrote it because I know other stuff that they've written or whatever. But sometimes I think those little 10-minute devotionals have been one of the greatest downfalls of the relationship of the church with Jesus. Paul would say of the Berean church that they were more noble than most because they searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what they were being told was true. They tested Paul. And a verse, a part of it, because you look at some of those devotionals, they'll, they'll put a little verse at the top or they'll put part of a verse at the top and then they put a little commentary in that verse. Or a life story that, that brought that verse to mind for that day. And it's intended to encourage you, and that's great. Have a little encouragement. But that's not daily Bible study. It's really not. You say, well, I don't have an hour every day to... I'm not telling you to do an hour every day. But you got an hour sometime. Right? You got a day... You had a half an hour, a couple of days in a row, maybe. I'm so busy. Then cut something out. Listen, this church is the church that, that is busy. So busy they've left. They didn't lose their first love. They left their first love. It became about just a name. And they didn't, they weren't drawn to their savior anymore I, I want you guys to come I want you to be it's all part of it right gathering together being in fellowship encouraging one another praying for one another 
everything we do on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or any other time we get together, sitting at the potluck tables and talking and, and you're developing relationships with each other, that's great. But to be honest with you, what I want more than anything is for you to come looking for Jesus and coming to be Jesus to somebody else, right? To, to be ready, not just to have yourself, your needs ministered to, but to minister to somebody else. Be ready for it. Pray for that before you come. Lord, who send some, if there's somebody who needs to know you love them, send them to me this morning. You know? Speak words of encouragement and, and, and whatever. Just But come to love people. Listen, if you come and help at the food pantry on a Saturday morning, don't come to just stand behind tables and set things out. I mean, it's great. It needs to happen. We don't just let the tables run out with everything else behind them and, and just talk. But we have some people that come, and even some regulars, who need somebody to talk to. Who need somebody to just be there for 15, 20 minutes of their life, of their week, of their month, because it's only once a month, man, of their month. Who's going to stand there and care about what they have to say. We see it over and over again, every, every distribution day. You know, don't, don't be, yeah, for sure, there are people who come in, they know the system, they know where to go, they, they know where all the food pantries are, and they can be there every week at a different one. And, they're, and maybe they're taking advantage or whatever, maybe there's a real need and they just have to know all of that, whatever. And they come in, they get their stuff, they leave, they don't want to talk to anybody, they just want to get their stuff and go. Let them go. But there are some who need to talk. There are some who need to pour out their hearts and need, just need to know somebody, somebody cares. We can be patient with people. We can not bear, look, at they didn't, you can't bear evil, he says to them. This is Jesus speaking to them now. It's not John. John's writing what Jesus is saying. He's dictating, or he's taking dictation from the Lord. He's writing it out. I know that you can't stand the evil of somebody. You, know, you, you don't tolerate that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Anybody who's just religious. Anybody who's just works oriented. Anybody who would say you have to do this, this, and this in order to be a believer. Rather than just believe. Okay. Now in Romans chapter 10, we go there. I, I try to go there every week. But... If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. With the promise that follows after that, all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. And people will say, well, that's, you know, you're just teaching cheap grace and whatever else. And, and, and no, to call somebody Lord is not cheap. You don't teach repentance. Yes, I do. And, and, and in that, in Lord, you are submitting to God. And repentance is taught throughout the Bible. So, yep, it's part of your salvation. It is. Which means now you enter into a fight for the rest of your life. Called sanctification. Breaking away from this life and from the world. And trying to keep it off of you. In, in day to day, knowing I can't do this by myself, I have to go to the Lord. He said, You've tested those who are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So you, you had some who were still trying to promote themselves as, as apostles. And the apostles, when the Bible talks about the apostles, it, it means sent out one at its basic meaning. But we know the apostles, including Paul, saw the risen Lord. Right? They saw him after his resurrection. Paul's was unique in that it was on the road to Damascus. 
but they saw him. And they were given wisdom to know and to write, to write scripture. These guys today that call themselves apostles, they're trying to write on something that they don't have. Right? There, there's no biblical apostles anymore. Right? The, the, the 12 and, and Paul, that's it. And, and so that, that apostolic age is where is the church age that, that Ephesus pertains to. Now, I think I've mentioned before that each of these letters is going to be able to be broken down into a, a, an age or a, a set of years of, of the church, uh, of the whole of the church age up to today. And so those who want to apply this, they'll say that Ephesus, that church, kind of applies from the Pentecost, from their Pentecost in, in 33 AD to about 100 AD. In the next one, the Church of Smyrna, that's going to go from 180 to about 312 AD, when Constantine finally makes Christianity legal. And it's going to speak to those age, those, those sets of years or those age times of, of, of church history. And so we saw, in, in, if we go through, through the book of Acts, and as we read the letters to Timothy and to Titus from Paul, that age time. And even John's letters and, and, and Peter's letters, those, those ages or that, that time period was a time when the church was doing a lot. It would, and it was growing and it was spreading, right? But, and, and as it's easy to do, they've lost or left, I'm sorry, they've left their first love. And so he lists off all these great things about him in verses 2 and 3, but then in verse 4, nevertheless. Man, I do not want to hear that from Jesus. I didn't want to hear that from my parents. You, you ever bring home a report card? Man, you're doing great in science. You're doing great in history. You're doing pretty good in, in, in whatever else I had. You're doing, we're not even going to talk about Jim because that was easy for you. You know, it, but math, Glenn, come on. And I'm like, but dad, I don't get it, so come on. <laughs> and it was kind of this thing, right? I'm looking at this, this is all right, this is all right, this is all right. But nevertheless, I have this against you, son. You have left, <laughs> you have left the building during math class. <laughs> I'm like, but, you know, and I had all the excuses and everything. And, and my, he wanted me to take uh, algebra one in ninth grade. I know they take it in like seventh or eighth grade now. Wanted me to take it in ninth grade. That was the college prep stuff and putting me in all this. And I'm like, Dad, I don't even know I'm going to college. I'm in ninth grade. I'm going. I'm in eighth grade. I'm going into ninth grade. And I have to have my. There's no way my math teacher is signing off on me having the highest level math class next year. There's just take it into it because you know we had to put out our. our <laughs> In my case, what my parents wanted me to take in my freshman year. And then you had to have your teachers in eighth grade sign off on, yeah, he's ready for this. So we had our, we had our final exam in eighth grade. And my teacher had called my dad twice in the last month of school about what I wasn't doing. <laughs> I'm like, it's not good. You realize how much trouble you're getting me into. And he did. He did realize so I take my, at the day of the final exam, I take my, my schedule in that my dad wants, and he said, this is ridiculous. I said, well, you know, you call my dad again for me, will you? I mean, that's kind of my attitude. And I'm like, I don't know, this is what my dad wants. So he just took my schedule and he set it on his desk. Everybody else's, man, he's just signing off, hand it back, here you go. Takes mine and sets it on the desk. He said, we'll see you at the end of class. Go back and take the, the final exam. I was not a smart kid. We get done with our final exam. He grades everything right there in that class all the same day. And as he's handing them out, he's like, only two people got 100%. I'm sorry, the number you got 100%, but only two people got the two extra credit questions at the end right. I'm like, 
I'm just going to be happy if it says D plus C minus. I'm good because it's going to get me out of Algebra 1 and I'm going to get out of 8th grade. And so he hands one to the one kid who everybody was no surprise. He got all the questions right, got the two extra questions credits right. He said, and Mr. Cisco, plop, and put it on my desk. I'm like, what? How did I get everything right? Everything. He went over to his desk. He took my schedule, signed it off. Boom, here you go. Guess what you're taking next year? <laughs> no. Had a lot of, nevertheless, Glenn, nevertheless, son, we have this issue with this class. Listen, I don't want to hear that from Jesus. Nevertheless, you have left your first love. It's kind of like, where have you been? Glenn, where have you been? And I've, I, have, I have felt this a number of times in my walk with the Lord. Where have you been? Why weren't you here? During my, my, my time as a prodigal, some of you have heard this already, but during my time was not walking with the Lord and being rebellion against God. I just, you know, feeling the, the, knowing that, that God was with me in a place I shouldn't have been. And I'm like, why are you here with me? He said, why did you bring me here? I told you when you were young, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Remember that verse that got you through your parents' divorce, that got you through, you remember that? Remember my promise to you, so why did you bring me here? I, I have too many times heard, where have you been? Not that I audibly hear that, but just have that sense when I sit down and my Bible's open and I begin to read, and I realize I haven't been here in a while. And not just the passage, but I haven't been here by myself, Bible open, in too, way, way too long of a time. And, and these words kind of, and should, come back to haunt me, haunt us. I have this against you. You left your first love. But he doesn't say, you, remember, you left your first love. You've been gone a while. You've, you've, you've gotten off focus. So you're out of here. He says, remember, therefore. See, correction is hard, but correction is good. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Repent. Stop doing it, right? Turn around, go the other way. That's what repent means. Repent and do the first works. Do the first works. What are the first works? I mean, weren't those other works the first works? Weren't that? You're telling me I'm doing all these works. I have this big long list, but nah, I've left my first love. But go back and do the first works. Do the things that were meaningful to you when you first got saved. What did you want to do? You want to be in the Word? I mean, I was eight years old. I remember sitting with my King James Bible. So don't tell me you can't understand it. Eight years old. My King James Bible. Reading it by myself. And having some understanding. And when I didn't, go into my dad or going to somebody else and say, hey, what does this mean? Is this, is this, does this mean what I think it does? You know? Telling people about him. You know, <laughs> there, there's a, a saying in the church, don't, don't just talk the talk, but you got to walk the walk, right? But sometimes you can walk the walk and never talk the talk, and you're still out of balance. 
you got to do both. You got to be able to walk and talk at the same time. I know that's difficult for some of us guys sometimes to, to walk and talk at the same time. Right? But we got to be able to walk this life according to the Lord. And we got to open our mouths. We need to be able to say something. Some kind of, and listen, if you want to know what to say to people, you read your Bible, you study your Bible, you draw close to the Lord, and you have these life experiences. You can look back and see where God was with you when you felt all alone, and now on this side of it, you know He was there. You can remember the times when you were encouraged, when, and maybe at the moment you didn't even understand it. But, but whatever, you... You have things to share with other people. You know, maybe it's not the same circumstance, but it's still the same feeling. We can feel alone for a lot of different reasons, but we can all feel alone. But we know that we're not. And you take people to the verses that brought you out of that mentality of I'm just doing this all alone I don't think God is really here I don't know if God's really here we all, we all turn into Job sometime I don't know what's going on I don't know why it's happening I didn't do anything wrong I don't and, you know you got friends who have all the right answers that are not really right answers And listen, you don't have to love God first, right? The Bible tells us we love Him because He loved us first. He says, remember, remember the beginning. Remember what you came out of. Remember how thankful you were when you realized my sins have been forgiven. I'm not on the road to hell anymore. Remember that. Remember what it feels like or what it felt like, what it meant to you. I mean, I've had experiences uh, with the Lord and most of the time through other people that I will never forget in my life. I go back to them often to be encouraged again and again. Remember those things. Repent and do the first works. Go back to that. Or else, I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Right? Go back to it. Or your influence is, is not going to be there anymore. If we're not willing to really submit to the Lord, we can do all the things, we can have all the programs, but we're not delivering the gospel. We can look good, but sooner or later we're going to fade away. But there's that last little bit. I'm going to come quickly, I'm going to remove the lampstand unless you repent. But if you'll repent, then you don't have to worry about it. You want to be used by God, get to know God. Love Him. Don't let the things you do for Him just become routine. It, it's really easy. And the pastors are not immune from this. It's really easy to have a schedule that brings you to the church that has you go through the Bible and, and study See, even that if I'm only preparing for Sunday morning I'm just doing a work if this isn't eating me up as I'm or I don't have my own personal time if, if this is not hitting me and I'm only designing it to hit you, it's just a work. And listen, Jesus, Jesus warned that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. 
It's one of the signs. Man, if you are a person who's been a people person in the past, but you don't want to be anymore, and I understand, it's... <laughs> Ladies, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not safe to go to the grocery store without your husband most of the time. It, it's, it's not. It, it is a dangerous place out there. Even in our little town. Uh, we're, we're on our way to dinner. We were going up to, to Portage last night. And just me and, and Emma and Tracy, we got our Christmas tree. We took it home. We decided to go get something to eat. And on the way out of town here, there's a restaurant with four police cars in it. And, and they're standing up. I'm like, it's just a restaurant. It's not even a... I mean, I think they serve alcohol, but I don't think it's a, it's not a bar bar. You know, I'm like, what is this? It's not in a bad part of town. But, you know, you got one cop car up behind it. I'm like, and so then all the speculation. Huh, I wonder what, they're, they're catching somebody. They know somebody's in there. They got a tip. They got whatever. There's four cop cars in this little parking parking lot. It's happening all over the place. I understand that. But man, you've got to be willing to show the love of Jesus. If they reject it, they reject it. And I'm not suggesting, again, ladies, that you go out and put yourself in danger. Have your husband with you. And husbands, be praying. You don't like going to the grocery store? Too bad. Walk through the grocery store with them and pray. And see who the Lord brings to you. Just a smile. Man, I, I got so mad at myself. Just last week. I'm like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of being mad at everybody. I, was, I found myself just going through that day. I was just angry. I was just mad at everybody. I didn't like the way people were driving. You know, I didn't. I was just, I was angry. Uh, as I'm walking into the store, I'm not. I'm not going to do this. I can't keep doing this. I'm not being Jesus to anybody if I got this because I, I know I, my look betrays me. I get the look. Don't talk to me. Get away from me. Don't. Don't. I'm not going to make eye, con eye contact. But if you do, I'll burn a hole right through your head. Don't stay away from me. Don't touch me. Don't talk to me. And I'm like, Lord, this is not you. This is all me. I'm tired of being mad at everybody and angry with everybody. And I'm, I'm going through the store, and, and aisle to aisle, I had to remind myself, because <laughs> it's instant. Oh, well, let's test this, Glenn. How, how serious are you about this? You're going to get angry before you even get in the store, from the car to the door. Somebody's going to give me a reason, try to back over me with whatever. You know, I'm like, I'm just... I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I just felt like I was tangled up in knots. I'm like, I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good mentally. I don't feel good physically. It's been going on too long. I'm all bound up and tense all the time. And you go in the store, and you know what? Man, it just, uh, this simple little interaction with this, this lady and one of the little amigo things, standing by the, by the egg cooler there, and... Somebody, you know, she's waiting to get up in there. I'm waiting to get up in there. And I finally just said, you want some help? Because I can see her getting ready to struggle to get out of the thing. Said, you want some help? Let me get your eggs for you. I said, which ones do you want? And she told me, and I grabbed, how many do you want? One or two? Two. All right, hand them to you. And she had a big smile on her face and was thanking me. And I'm like, yeah, this feels much better than just being angry because somebody's in my way. <laughs> much better. We just smile at each other. We saw each other in another aisle, still smiling at each other, you know? I, she got her eggs. I got my eggs. We, we, you know, I may never see her again. But, man, I felt so much better. Because I had been letting myself get tied up in knots. And it's not hard. People give you all kinds of reasons to be like that. But, you know, 
You got to you got to repent. You need to repent. It's not like everybody else needs to repent so I can feel better. No, you and I, we need to repent and be the church that shows the love of Christ out there. Right? I didn't give her a gospel. I didn't I didn't I didn't We didn't have a theological conversation. We just said hi. It was just, thank you, you're welcome. And so much better. I could have done the same thing with just the intention of getting her out of my way. See the difference in the same action? Jesus is addressing their heart right here. What is your motivation for all of these works? Are you just checking off a list? You know? Or are you doing things because you love Jesus, he loves you, you know he loves you, it's overflowing out of you into everybody else, toward everybody else? Verse 7 says, He who has an ear... Right? So this is singular. This is to all of us, right? Everybody. Anybody who's hearing this, he who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says, and that's a continued thing, what the Spirit is saying to the churches, plural. And that's why I think all the churches read all the letters. Let him who has an ear hear Singular. Yeah, so you, you and I, we need to take this personally. Listen, as a church, we need to take it personally as a church. And we know that it spoke to, this was a real thing in a real church in this time. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes. It's really easy to be in a church, big or small, to, to go along because we want to belong. To be involved in the works and never know Jesus. Because we're doing what the church is doing. We like the people. We, we, we found a safe place. Whatever, whatever it is. We like the programs. We like the big setup. We like the little setup. Whatever, whatever it is. It's really easy to just go along. And kind of find your place. And find your niche. And do the work. And feel good about yourself. But you don't know Jesus. And that's why it says to him who overcomes. What are you overcoming in this? You're overcoming yourself. You're overcoming that, that desire to push away. It's promoted. It's, it's promoted in our culture right now. I mean, you, you hear about people who are I'm living off the grid, I'm growing my own food, raising my own animals. Nobody, I don't have to go to town ever. I don't have to see anybody. I don't have to talk to anybody. When it all falls apart, I'll be here in my little hobbit hole, and I'll be okay, and everybody else will just fall apart and, and, and be in chaos. But I'll be safe. You know, people lock themselves in their rooms. People lock themselves in their homes. People lock themselves into a career. And they never get outside of themselves. They get where they're comfortable, where they feel protected, where they feel like there's no... I mean, they got all the walls up. And they, they don't want to get outside of that. You need to overcome yourself. That's all designed to protect ourselves from being hurt. But love puts us out there where there's a real possibility of being hurt. 
Now, if you're if you're somebody who's single, you don't want to be hurt. Don't get married. And even if you think you found somebody where you can get it all together and everything's going to be fine and we're going to be wonderful forever, don't have kids. Right? You don't want to be hurt. Don't have friends. You don't want to be hurt? Don't come to church. Because we sit in a room, big or small, big congregation, little congregation, we all have our faults, and sometimes we rub up against each other like brothers. Listen, yesterday was, was at the beginning of the whole football season, I told you guys I had a Saturday with my brothers and my dad, uh, text messaging, we weren't all together in the same place, but just at the beginning of the season, and it was fun to be going back and forth about what was going on in the game and, and, and how pathetic the team we were watching or listening to w was being and how bad the coach well, Anyways, we were going back and forth. So yesterday's the big game, right? Michigan-Ohio State game. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what rivalry you think you have. It's the biggest one. Anyways, so yesterday for the first time in eight years, Michigan wins. Big game. I mean, it, it wasn't close. They beat them. It was great. I, have, I will confess, I've watched the highlights three times. But the best thing was, my dad, my brothers, we're on. We're going back and forth. We're talking about good things. We're talking about bad calls. And at the end of it, it went on into the evening, way after the game was over, making comments. One brother was out trying to watch it on his phone in the woods while he's deer hunting in Virginia. Another one of nephews in, in Idaho, and he's climbing a tree stand, and he's taking pictures and, and whatever, because we all like to hunt and fish and whatever. So we started talking about that stuff. And we started talking about memories. We started throwing memories out. And... and I can think, at the time, they probably weren't great. Although, I don't know, I thought it was pretty funny. We talked about tying our little brothers, putting life jackets on them, and tying them to us so when we were wading down the river fishing, they couldn't float away from us. Now, I a memory of my, my little brother throwing, gets his line hung up in the tree, because where we lived at the time, there was a river there. We liked to watch, watch the, or wade the river. And, Throws his line up in the tree, and I made him wait till I fished the hole out before I waited in to, to go get his line out of the tree. And uh, my dad's like, yeah, older brothers with little brothers. I said, yeah. And my other younger brother's like, well, you know, that's why he's such a well-adjusted young man now. <laughs> Anyways, we started throwing these memories back and forth, and, and we were laughing, and Listen, you, you, you can't be afraid. Listen, I'll be honest with you. Every single person on that tech, well, not everyone. My nephews haven't had the opportunity yet. But well, the one I talked about in the tree stand, he freaked us all out because when he was born, he had a heart problem right, out of, right at his birth. You know? I loved him be before he was born. He, he was coming into this world. He's going to be my nephew, my brother's son. He's born, he has his major heart problem. I can't be where my brother and sister-in-law are. I'm, I'm up here there at that time. I think we're in South Carolina. I mean, there's helicopter flights. There's moms here at this hospital, babies at this hospital, dads in between. And I can't do anything about it. And I love them, but I was heartbroken at that time, right? I'm worried. I'm scared out of my mind for my brother, for my nephew. And, and with the exception of him, every one of those guys on that, on that text, my brothers, even my dad, have made me mad somehow. Well, I've done the same for them, I'm sure. I know I have. So we could have pulled back because we're all this distance apart. We could pull back. We could not be involved with each other's life at all. 
Or we can tolerate the things we don't particularly care for, but still love each other. We can't be there right side by side, but we can we can still mourn if we have to together. We can we can have a good thing. I mean, I can't tell you how many COVID babies were born into my family this year. Two nephews and two grandbabies of my own. Two nephews had babies. That's just the ones I, I can think of right off the top of my head. So with all, all of the trials and tribulations of being family and being close and loving each other and, and all of the turmoil that also comes with that, we still love each other. In a, in a, in a much bigger way, in a much grander way, all the trials and, and trub- tribulations and turmoil that has come from uh, my walk with the Lord. I know he loves me. And all the effort it has taken to walk this walk and the things he's asked me to do that at times have become routine and, and, I, and, and in those situations I've left my first love and had to go back and, and refocus my motive for doing what I do. And, and, and I have had to repent and maybe you do too. We can't let this just be a routine way of life where we just do what we do because we belong to the church. And because we belong to the church, we get to name the name of Jesus. That's not how it works. You need to go to him. You need to name his name first. Or you, need, you, need to, you need to have a relationship with him and then focus on the works. Because it's an act of life. And, and it'll, it'll, it'll be labor. Some days you'll work to the point of exhaustion. You'll, you'll have days in this Christian life where doing something, it, it, I've, I've had enough. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. But then you take a deep breath and you start going anyways. That's why you say you, you do all these things, you work to exhaustion, but you don't grow weary. Right? You have this perseverance. You, you know, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the good thing. But maybe it needs to be more like we're doing the right thing, we're doing a good thing, being you and Jesus together. Hear what he has to say. The promise to him who overcomes. And and again, in in his last little dissertation there after the Last Supper and leading up to the arrest. Jesus himself says, I, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Right? Implying that because he has overcome the world, we also have overcome the world in him. All these churches are going to be to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. You can't overcome whatever shortcoming, you can't gain whatever promise he's promised without knowing him and being an overcomer through him, through Jesus I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Don't you want to be there? Listen, as you do whatever you do for the church or or whatever you think you do for the Lord, in the church, out of the church, whatever, Remember to do it as unto him. This isn't unto you. This is unto him. I thought we'd get through two churches. We're not going <laughs> to. But next week, Smyrna, read ahead. The, the goal is going to be to do two churches, but... We'll do at least the one. Smyrna, the persecuted church, the one who endures a lot of persecution. (coughs) 
Again, the church age there is from 100 to 312 A.D. Speaks of that horrible persecution during that time. Absolutely horrible. But, but, I want you to think about something as you're heading into that. The 20th century, they say, there were more martyrs for the faith in the 20th century than there was in all the other centuries put together. And, and, the 21st century, we're on track to top it. That's the persecution of the church today. So it's it's real possibility to have to face it. And I've already talked about this over and over again. Canada, uh, Australia, they're locking up pastors. They're burning down churches. That was something you used to just say about China or India or Indonesia. Indonesia's I mean, that's the place where they go, man. They'll, they'll show up at your church service, lock you in your building, and burn it to the ground with you in it. So we, we really need to pray for our brothers and sisters and, and ready ourselves for something to, to come here. And, and don't think it won't. They've already done it and tried it in, in L.A. and in New York. And, and, you know, winning court cases hasn't stopped them from continuing to try. Just because the church is one in court doesn't mean they're, they're stopping. They just double down on what they're doing. So understand that. And we'll look at it next week. Persecution is, is part of our life. It's part of the walk with the Lord. But this church, there's nothing bad said about it. It's one of two out of the seven. Church of Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia. The only two churches where there's no rebuke. We'll look at one. We'll look at Smyrna next week, Lord willing, and, and hopefully Pergamos next week as well. As long as I move through a little faster than I did today. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, I, I just want to lift up anybody today who maybe realizes that in some way they've left their first love. They've lost their motivation. They're not... They're doing things. It looks good, but it's been routine. And and they haven't been walking through these things with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would convict all of us, not just any one person, but, Lord, all of us. Where do we need to change? Where do we need to put our focus back on you rather than on ourselves or rather than just on the list? Lord, remind us that as we, as we speak to somebody this week, we're not just speaking smartly, but we're to have the love and compassion that you have for that person. Saved or lost, Lord, help us to know how, how to regain that position of, of love How do we come back? Where do we need to come back? We know all the words. We know the verses. Lord, I pray that this week especially it would begin to take root in all of us, your love, that we would heed your warning that the love of many would grow cold. Lord, even that we would spend time in in 1 Corinthians 13. Or in First John, where you tell us how to love, how important it is. And Lord, that we would desire that in that day that we stand before you, we would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But not just because we checked off a list, but because we were dwelling in you, that we spent time in your word, we, we were abiding in your word. Lord, you said that if we love you, we'll keep your commandments. We'll know your word. We'll keep them in our heart. Lord, 
Lord, this week, draw us all very close to you. As we enter into this season when we're going to remember how, how you physically and practically poured out your love on us by just coming and being born. This is an important season that we're entering into. Lord, help us when there's so much promotion of hate and division. Help us to be unified in the church with love, with grace and mercy for each one. And Lord, help us to be ready to love those who may walk through these doors looking for love, looking for looking for you. Looking for somebody who cares. Prepare our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.